shaking all over. Them guys over at UMKC, I think they were kind of getting ha organized to a certain degree in the uh, fall of 64. Jim Lyons, Jim Kafka, Fahrenbach, Danny McFarlane was also over at UMKC, and Bill, Bill Harling. Tim, Tim McNally, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly how he was, whether he was going to UMKC for another semester or something, you know what I mean? Butch Putoff was, he was going to Rockers with me. Eddie Freshen was going to Rockers with me. Uh, Frank Maricatani was going to Rockers with me. Jim Lyons was a friend of of uh, Butch Putoff, and Butch asked me if I wanted to play, so I said, yeah. When I was at Rockers College, I would hear guys talking about it, that they were starting a club in Kansas City, but I didn't know anything about it. And one of my best friends, Jim Lyons, called me one night on a Friday and said, uh, you know, we, we're playing Kansas University uh, the next day. Would you uh, be interested in playing? I told him I don't know how to play. He says, don't worry about it. We'll explain it to you on the way up. And so that's where I learned my rugby. My, that They told me what to do, which was pretty simple. They just said, kick the ball out of bounds because you could kick it for touch from anywhere on the field in those days and just stop anybody with the ball. And that, that's basically uh, all I knew. And uh, I was hooked after that. I just remember running down and uh, I didn't know that they they had fair catches, and I just remember went down and hit one of the Kansas City guys, and they were all crying and bitching about, it. oh, man, you know, but fuck, I didn't, we didn't, <laughs> I didn't know the rules yet. We obviously we only played around two to three matches a season, and in those days, as today, we had two seasons: the spring and the fall season, and. Uh, so we, it was like a home and away game between Kansas Jayhawks or Kansas City Rugby Club. So we would occasionally go to St. Louis. They had several teams in St. Louis. And, uh, and in the early days, Rolla had a team. St. Benedict's, which is now called Benedictine, had a team. And uh, you know those were home and away games also. I know that Either that spring or the fall, the 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 UMKC bought 
jerseys for us and they were imported, I remember them because they were imported from England, England or Canada probably and I remember when they got there they had to go down and uh, whoever was on the Jim Lyons or somebody like that went down to the post office and they had to pay duty on them to get them in because they were manufactured in Canada or I think it was Canada or England. When we were no longer supported by UMKC we became rockers college uh, rugby club in 1965 because uh, maybe three or four of us were going to rockers at that time and they let us actually use their field to play Benedictine or St. Benedict's one, one Saturday. So we uh, then had to buy a, a, a set of blue jerseys because that's the colors of uh, rockers so that's what we wore then. Well, it's a pretty well-known story that uh, when we were in, at Rockers, we had a slight altercation in Westport after a uh, match, and uh, the word got out to the Rockers uh, dean, and uh, they found out about that, and they kicked us off campus. We played Kansas City out in uh, Swope Park, then we went down to Kelly's and they were buying. And uh, there were a bunch of guys in, in a truck, a, a big truck, and eventually we found out they were uh, from the Art Institute, but they had beards and stuff like that and they looked like <laughs> wild people and all that. So they came out to the game out at Swope Park and then we, uh, there was always a couple of agitators on the blues. And so we went down to Kelly's and we're drinking quarts of beer. And anyways, they were put off with looking for an excuse for a fight. So anyways, he, somebody supposedly said something to his wife and so boom, boom. So we just decided to uh, meet, have a meeting and we met at a, at a, a bar called Jimmy's Jigger. It was uh, actually a bigger jigger, but Jimmy Bars, who owned the place, was so uh, famous, I guess, as a, a bar owner that they named the place Jimmy's Jigger. And Jimmy gave us some money to have parties and, and uh, buy jerseys and what have you. He's the only one that would give us money at that time. And so we met there and uh, he had a uh, a private club in Kansas called the Blue Ginger. Oh, s excuse me, the Blue Garter. I remember one of our scam things was we had a beer, I mean, some kind of party. Uh, it was supposed to be barbecue and uh, beer, and the barbecue was barbecued chips and and. Uh, it was over in Kansas City, Kansas, and some, I think it was, somebody remind me, and I think it was the Blue Guard or whatever that, it was just a 3-2 joint. So we were sitting around trying to think of a name, and he, uh, somebody said, well why don't, why don't we call it the blue, us the Blue Guarders, since Jimmy owns a Blue Garter and we can wear Blue Garters, and everybody went, no. <laughs> So somebody else suggested that we be called just plain Kansas City Blues. It's just an old uh, Kansas City name. I mean, there was a baseball team named the Blues. There was a, a minor league baseball team named the Blues. There was a, even a hockey team named the Blues. So we took the name as uh, the Kansas City Blues. something for me something you call love but confess you've been a messin' where you shouldn't have been a messin' and now someone else is getting all your best these boots are made for walking and that's just what they'll do one of these days these boots 
start gonna walk all over you Yeah, I, I could have started playing in 66, right after graduation from high school. A uh, friend of my, my best friend from high school, Bill Flaherty, he had gone out for rugby. He, he went out, and it was August, and he says, you got to try this, man, with your football and soccer skills. This is this is a perfect sport for you. So I went to one practice, and the next day, my high school coach called me and says, hey, I got you a football scholarship to St. Mary of the Plains in Dodge City, Kansas. So that curtailed my rugby for uh, a couple of years while I went and played college football. So I uh, ran into Hemer. Hemer was going to UMKC, too, uh, at the time I was. And he said, uh, I found a game for you. I said, oh, yeah? He goes, yeah. Anybody can play. Any size body can play. One of the things that... I'm, I'm proud of being associated with the Blues. That I was always a good recruiter. Uh, you know, Wubin was one of my better recruits because uh, he and I uh, played soccer together in high school. So I went out and, you know, the first practice there were probably seven people there. And, uh, you know, you need 15 for a game. So come the weekend, there were 15 people there, but I probably went to two practices before I even played a game had no idea what the game was, had never seen it on TV. Even before I played the game, they stuck me at center. He, uh, he had played a half against Rockers, and we went to, San F to Aspen. Went on to continue to play, and I think the next second or third game I played was actually in Aspen, Colorado. We were gonna play a San Francisco rugby club, and uh, they, uh, Frank, came to me and says, Hemer says, we don't have anybody to play hooker. And I says, well, let's throw Wubin in there because he played soccer in high school, so he should be able to heal the ball. They didn't know where to put me because I was new as a rookie. Almost everybody was anyway, but they put me in at hooker and the first game, and we played the San Francisco Rugby Club. And we didn't know it at the time, but the guy for the San Francisco Rugby Club was a... Uh, uh, Aussie, uh, played rugby for how many many years. But And I had no idea what Hooker was or what he was to do. They told me just, you know, hook the ball back and the scrum half will get it and get it out to the backs. Well, <laughs> I didn't even see the ball because, you know, as scrums come together, the Hooker from San Francisco was using his neck to hold me up. My feet were off the ground the whole game, so I didn't even have an opportunity to hook. But uh, Wubin said he knew he was in trouble when his forehead touched his toes. <laughs> the guy had bent him back <laughs> in a, like a pretzel. And so uh, he says his feet never touched the ground during, <laughs> during those scrums. And I thought, oh, well, that's how that guy is too. <laughs> but I, I, when I got through with that game, my neck hurt so bad that uh, I didn't sleep for two or three nights. So, but then Wubin obviously came back, he loved it. So that was my introduction to rugby as well as the trip to uh, Aspen. I was 19 years old and I was traveling with obviously a bunch of degenerates. Um, and that's how I got introduced to rugby. I was down at, uh, in, in 60, February of 69, I was at the Mardi Gras in New Orleans and saw a couple of guys walking down Bourbon Street, Kansas City Blues Rugby Club jacket. Says, oh God, I, gotta, I really like that. I gotta get back into rugby. So I says, well, come back to Kansas City and you know, when season starts, come on out and play. And by the time I got back to Kansas City, I got offered a pro soccer tryout. Uh, with the Kansas City Spurs. They were the pro soccer team back in the 60s. And uh, so I uh, ran my ass off, got in sh unbelievable, tremendous shape, and uh, did the soccer tryout and eventually got cut. And I went from getting cut from them to going to my first rugby game. And I weighed 175 pounds 
and just an unbelievable fitness, uh, obviously after you know a pro soccer tryout. Of course, everybody in rugby was just lollygagging, drinking beer. So I mean, they were amazed that you know, I was just running around everybody and just yeah, just having a ball. So that's how I got started in the spring of '69 uh, with rugby. Well, I worked at the bank at 69th and Prospect, which is good neighborhood, and. Uh, Jay Garrett was going with a gal that, that worked there, a teller. She um, uh, was from England and so forth, but Jay was playing with the Blues at that time. And uh, he kind of encouraged me to come out. And I'd seen newspaper articles about rugby and all that, and I thought it, that'd be a good uh, thing to try out, so I did. We were practicing over at UMKC and, uh, and and it was, you know, it was an interesting game. I mean, you had to really kind of figure out how to play the game. Uh, and when I first started, you know, when we did start playing, we were practicing most of the time there. That's, it was in the late summer, I guess, when I started practicing. And... Uh, you know, I got to play a few games and kind of figured it out a little bit, and it was just, it was, it was a good game. And, you know, it wasn't like football at all. It was, you know, you were out there all the time, offense, defense. It was just a super game. I was attending University of Kansas when uh, my brother and uh, Gary Massey, uh, they were going to go with the Blues down to Mardi Gras to play rugby. And I was, I was not playing, I was practicing football at KU. Uh, I was a walk-on and uh, so it coincided where I could go to Mardi Gras and I was getting to go, you know, with the big guys, you know, hell, they were a lot older and so I get to Kansas City and we get in the car and off to Mardi Gras we go and we get down there and hell, there's a big party going on, there's no question about that. <laughs> And they named their starting 15, and I'm not one of the starting 15. They let some guy named Smelly play instead of me, and uh, there's a reason why they called him Smelly. Which, uh, to me, I'm, I'm looking over here at the, the party, and I'm looking over here at the rugby game, you know, and uh, off to the party I went, you know, and uh, hell, the next day or next game, they're looking for me, and they can't find me, and the next day they're looking for me, and they can't find me. And me and this other guy were down in Bourbon Street, you know, we had a hell of a time. So, uh, Ended up, we drove back a long, long trip you know, when you were that hungover. <laughs> and uh, then the following week, uh, I played for the Blues, and then also I started practicing up KU uh, with their rugby team, and I played for both of them back and forth, you know. And then eventually I just switched over and started playing for the Blues. I had seen rugby. I was going to school at Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, Kansas, playing football, and during the spring we went down to, a couple of us went down to Mardi Gras. And uh, the Blues were at a Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras tournament down there, and we knew Gary Massey, he was playing with them at the time. He'd graduated the year before from Pittsburgh, and he'd played football down there, actually he was an All-American uh, guard. But anyway, he was, uh, he was down there, we found out he was there, we went and watched a couple of games, didn't know what was going on with it. but. Later that year, when I was back in Kansas City, uh, Massey called and asked if I'd be interested in playing rugby with the Blues. I said I didn't know anything about it, and, and uh, he and Tommy Doyle came and, and persuaded me that I ought to go play. Uh, and myself and Tom Kennard, who was another ball player down there, and a, a fellow named Jim Brennan. Uh, and we all three went to a game in Warrensburg. And, uh, I fell in love with it immediately, and uh, Brennan and Kennard weren't particularly impressed. They, they uh, had other ideas about what they wanted to do spending their time and weekends with. For, first match was against Warrensburg. We just, I think we scraped together 15 people to play. And uh, like I said, I enjoyed it tremendously. It was cold and sort of crappy that day. But uh, the next weekend, we, uh, I, I believe we played at KU the next weekend. And, uh, and Brennan and Kennard, my two friends from Pittsburgh, didn't want to go. And uh, it was another sort of cold, crappy weekend. And uh, I met Wubenhorst and some other people then uh, at that point and started developing some rapport with them. And uh, it just went from there. It was uh, after the KU game, I was pretty much addicted. And 
Uh, yeah, we didn't practice. We practiced a couple times a week back then. We were practicing uh, sometimes at Swope Park and sometimes at uh, UMKC and you know, sort of around the, the metro, the center part of the city. But uh, I just became addicted to it. I had the people, I just, I, I fell in love with the people. We had, uh, and, and eventually just uh, the sport pretty much consumed a lot of my life, you know, thinking about it and being involved in it. And we, Jay and I, we always ran after, on Saturdays. We, start, we started running the course, that course that everybody hated. <laughs> But we ran it, and which it started down by the lagoon and ran up around the entrance to Swope Park down 63rd and then back to the lagoon there. That was probably about four, a little over four miles or so. And one, one time Tommy Doyle, he wanted to run with us, so we did, and we just, we both just beat the heck out of him. And, and he thought that was, uh, be a good way to get everybody in shape. <laughs> so that's why he started started that, I think. Uh, in any case, that was a good course. He, he added the stairs to it, you know, the, going up to the golf course there and then back around, that added another mile to it. You know, Doyle, uh, he, uh, his first wife and the gal that I was dating were real close friends, so we, went, we did a lot of stuff together. In fact, uh, I, I lived on 53rd and Troost, a block from Mike's, right on Troost. And uh, Doyle, uh, he lived a, a block off of Troost, so like he was right behind me. Uh, so he could climb down the brick wall, or the stone wall, and come bang on my door at six o'clock in the morning to remind me that it was time that we needed to go out and run about four or five miles. So uh, uh, and he was not to be denied on that, of course. <laughs> As I remember, my brother Pat talked to Rutherford about coming over, uh, you know, and helping out running, you know, booze because they did need some leadership in there. The beginning was the uh, the winter of 1971. Uh, a guy named Pat Doyle, Tommy's older brother, asked me if I would uh, entertain the idea of taking over the blues and bringing them back to life. And we started going through some hard times at that point as far as uh, misspent monies, you know, we not, not like we had a lot of money, but uh, there was a case of uh, the president of the club uh, would collect dues and go to Kelly's and drink pretty good scotch you know, and uh, hell, we wouldn't even have money for a keg of beer after, you know, the next weekend after he left Kelly's, and then, uh, so he kind of agreed to this, and, uh, but he still had to go through the uh, election, so in the spring of that year, we had an election, I got elected captain, and Rutherford got elected president, and Kenny Coleman was elected treasurer. Yeah, well, you know, I work at a bank, and I'm pretty, uh, anal about money and then making sure everything balances and and it's all accounted for and all that kind of stuff and and Kenny Coleman was the most valuable asset that we ever had because Coleman uh, he didn't take excuses for why you didn't give it the money and you know if you didn't pay your dues I was always around to remind you to pay the dues and I noticed how at the beginning of the season and people kind of stay away from me so they wouldn't get reminded <laughs> And if he didn't, you didn't pay, he'd come to me and say, you know, before the game started, they hadn't paid. Well, they didn't get to play if they didn't pay. And Pat stepped down, and I took over leadership of the Blues. And at that transition, there were no jerseys to speak of. Nobody knew where they were. No balls, no money, no roster, no game scheduled for the spring of 72. So we started, you know, uh, accumulating a little bit of funds, enough to get a jersey, set of jerseys, because, uh, hell, we, I had a K-State uh, football jersey that my roommate played K-State. That was my jersey that I'd played in originally. I brought some skill things to the practices. Tommy ran the practices. Uh, went to Snowden Mize and bought some practice football jerseys. Put the numbers on the back, put the crest on the front. And Rutherford, uh, he got us uh, what they were football practice jerseys, and he screen printed one through 15 on there. And that was our first jerseys. Ordered a couple of balls in from uh, Bob Hoder. He was uh, rugby imports time, just starting. 
and I also ordered in some socks. And uh, that was the beginning. That was the second life put into the blues. But the, then he also, what he did, he, we were always going to Mike's, so he uh, swung a deal with Mike Renner uh, where Renner would give us a keg of beer, which saved us, you know, thirty, forty-five dollars a week. Which, you know, what, you know, once again, doesn't sound like much money, but hell, when you didn't have thirty, forty-five dollars, it was money, and you had a keg of beer. So, Rutherford did a lot of things like that, setting up uh, deals where we were saving or making a little bit of money, and Coleman was saving the money, and then hell, we had our, uh, you know, what basically I call the developmental years after the initial startup years, where. Uh, we got ourselves in shape to be able to play a whole game. Most of the guys played. I mean, if you could run a six minute well, you could play rugby. Since we didn't have more than 15 to 18 at a practice, usually the first half of a match was more of a practice session for us. And then the second, the second half, they, nobody could keep up with us because we were too fit. We just ran over them. We, our, most of our matches were won in the second half. We could be behind two or three tries at halftime. Didn't mean daily shit. Because after the last 20 minutes of the game, we were as fit as the first 20 minutes of the game. But most clubs didn't take fitness to that level like we did back in the 70s. They just didn't do it. When Doyle took over and introduced conditioning to the Blues, I think that was a big deal. Because before then, you know, really was conditioning was never that big of an issue. You know, it was, everybody was on their own, but uh, Doyle made it mandatory that we all run. Uh, you know, we had the five mile course in Swo Park and you know, uh, I always enjoyed running. I uh, got when I first joined the team, uh, Frank, I used to meet Frank over at uh, Loose Park and we'd run, you know, three, four laps around Loose Park and, you know, that, that was a good bonding time with Frank to get him to know him and everything, yeah. But uh, yeah, getting, getting Rutherford to do the administrative stuff and Doyle to get the team in shape uh, to where we could, uh, you know, you know, there were so many times they'll they'll say, you know, I said, you know, he'd walk out on the field and after the first couple of hits and everything, he says, "We've got this one," and uh, and it was probably true. I, I think there was an arrogance that that came with that was fostered because of Tommy. I mean, Tommy really was just he was invincible. He was determined. He was, and it was his his. Uh, uh, you know, metaphysically, he could lift you all up. I mean, he could he could just inspire you because you knew how much he cared, you knew how hard he worked at it. And, uh, and not everybody loved Tommy. I mean, Tommy was not, he's not a, not a lovey-huggy kind of guy when it comes to this sort of thing, but uh, uh, he certainly could inspire you, whether he was threatening to, to punch you or whether he was uh, out running miles and, and trying to lead the pack. I mean, he just, uh, uh, I, I enjoyed playing with him and we, we had a lot of good times and we, we bantered a lot and I think we had a good uh, a high level of respect for each other and uh, he, he just he was an inspiration to everybody yeah. Mir Catania was quite a character you know he weighed you probably heard this but he weighed probably 270 280 back in those days and man I've got some pictures of him and I, he was just one scary individual scary looking individual and he obviously was uh, <clears throat> had made a name in rugby. You know Frank you know he was about 290 back then 290, 300 pounds, and nobody messed with Frank. Even even the guys in the hood, they, they just left Frank alone. He just he just looked mean and nasty. And he was, you know, because I, I saw Frank get in several fights, and he had he had some of the uh, quickest hands around, and he could just deck people. I'm always known as uh, the Tank, Frank the Tank, okay. and uh, and uh, Pat O'Neill gave me that name. Wally. James Michael Morgan is his real name, but everybody calls him Wally. Start playing with the Blues, met him in 1967 uh, in Swope Park. Five of us from Rockhurst High School went out and watched him play. Um, got infatuated with it. I left and went to the Army, was gone for three years. Luckily made it through Vietnam, came back and started playing rugby immediately. So I was watching some rugby out at Swope Park like in the 
71 or something like that. But uh, Ray Ritchie, uh, who I grew up with, uh, said he was going to start playing rugby. And so that, I think, it was in 73. And he'd already played with a team in Indiana. Um, and when he came back to Kansas City, I remember the first few years I played, it was uh, it wasn't out of the ordinary to go to Des Moines to play uh, rugby, and we'd have 14, 15 guys, and we'd have to play both games because that's all the all the players we had. But uh, it just seems like it's so much better run and organized now than it was back in those days. I went to Rockers College. And I graduated from Rockers College, and during that time, I spent a lot of time at Mike's Tavern, as did every Rockers person. Um, went away, moved away, took a job away out of town, came back to town, and uh, <clears throat> gravitated towards Mike's Tavern again. And that, by that time, the Blues uh, were hanging around there on Tuesday and Thursday nights, I believe it was. And, uh, uh, one of the blues persons at that time was a, was a high school uh, friend of mine named Tom Hemer. Tom kept saying, uh, why don't you play this game, you're a natural, you know, I, was, I played football and ran track in high school, and played some basketball, and, uh, he thought I would have been good at it, uh, I just kind of blew him off for a while and then I got to know some of these guys like uh, Mike Gavhart, Tommy Doyle, and Pat O'Neill and some of the uh, senior statesmen of the, of the club and uh, decided to give it a whirl. So uh, went out to practice and probably in 1974 uh, played uh, one to be a back guy, but my actual first game was uh, in the scrum at second row. Uh, my uh, coaching was uh, year number four, just follow around number five and do what he does and you'll be okay. And that was that was my training because I only been to like two practices. My first match was up in Lawrence, Kansas against the Jayhawks. Uh, I rode up there with Jake Smith, Joe Fagan, a motley crew to say the least. So uh, rode up there one afternoon uh, <clears throat> as a fall match. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't. We stopped at every bar we could find on K-10 on the way back. And had a, a beer or two and uh, made it home safe, but uh, that was my first game. Well, when I was in, um, in when, I, when I graduated from college in the spring of '74, I, uh, uh, I was coming home and I and I or coming home to Kansas City and I went through um, Lawton, Oklahoma, to see a friend of mine that had, was stationed there in in uh, Fort Sill. I played football with him in in, in college and um, I went down to see him, see him and his wife and he was uh, playing rugby. He, was, he had sent me a couple of letters, told me how much he liked it, and said I'd probably like it too. And so I went down there and went to a couple of practices and had a good time. And decided, yeah, it'd be fun to pursue. So when I got back to Kansas City, I started looking around and I kept asking people, "What do you, you know, where do you get all of the blues?" Because back then there was no uh, websites, and um, you know, so we were. Uh, I was kind of looking around, and somebody told me to go down to Swope Park because a lot of those guys ran down there on Sunday mornings. So I went down there one one, one Sunday, and I ran into Jay Garrett, and he gave me his, his you know, he got my phone number and said he was. Had been playing with the Blues, but he was going to start playing with uh, River Key, and they were starting to team up. And where I want to come out, and so I went down, and um, <clears throat> you know, I told him, "Yeah, sure, it'd be great." And then about a week before we were supposed to start practice, and he called me and said that uh, he decided to go with the Blues instead, go back to the Blues instead, and I was welcome to come out and play with the Blues. So I went to the first practice, and still here. Uh, the way I got involved in rugby was a kidnapping. I was uh, in my fraternity house on a Saturday morning in Pittsburgh, Kansas, completely hungover. 
and uh, a couple of guys broke into my room. It was real easy. All you had to do is use a credit card to, to open the, the doors, whether they were locked or not. Uh, carded the door and uh, came in and basically grabbed my football shoes, my high school football shoes out of the closet, put me over uh, his shoulder, the guy by the name of Gary Shaw, uh, and uh, put me in a car and drove me to Kansas City where my first rugby match was uh, playing for Pittsburgh State against the Kansas City Blues. Well, I was playing football at the University of Kansas and I had a motorcycle and the coach told me that I had to get rid of my motorcycle and I basically told him fuck off or whatever if you bleep that out whatever and so some guys I knew uh, played rugby for KU and they were just happened to be going to Aspen and uh, like this was a Thursday night or a Wednesday night and I was at the Hawk and I just said I'm going I jumped in the car and we got up there and back then they played in October towards the end of October so when they had the games, they actually used blue cheer on the sidelines because there was snow in the field. And it was a wild trip out there. I mean, there was a blizzard. We went over Independence Pass. We'd never been over it before in the snow and we weren't supposed to go. Didn't have any idea what we'd done until the next year when we saw what we'd driven over that year. But so the first game I played in, this guy just said, follow me around and tackle a guy, get the ball, run with it basically. So early on I was going downhill in Aspen and I, you know, I got a kick, the ball kicked to me and um, you know, I had probably one of the longest runs of my rugby career down the sideline and there was a big crowd, you know, big Aspen crowd. And a guy just cut my legs out from under me and I landed in the slop and I slid a long ways on my back and everybody was kind of funny to the crowd, you know. And when I slid into the crowd, I slid into like a case of beer and some wine stacked up and these guys helped me up and one guy handed me a beer and the other guy handed me a, something else <laughs> and I thought well this is kind of fun so you know so that was the first weekend and I just from then on I think the next weekend we actually played the blues and it, or the next game and I'd had about a, and we actually had a good coach we had a guy from Scotland that was really good so we were one of the few teams that really had any kind of real coaching back then and so I remember hearing about the blues and how tough they were and mean and how they beat up everybody and I'm a big K football player I don't give a crap you know and so they get up there and the first person I see get out of the car is Frank Mercatani back when he was weighing whatever 300 pounds and hair out to here and uh, you know, I'm just kind of looking at him like, oh, this is, you know, and, and you could just tell by looking at him that these were men, you know, that weren't going to put up with shit. These, because in Aspen we played like Air Force, which was a really good team, but they weren't, they didn't, you know, they didn't intimidate anybody. And uh, so I played prop. And, you know, I don't even remember how the game came out. It was just a game typical with the Blues or a bunch of fights and stuff. And, you know, I had no idea. I think it was the first and last time. I think I played prop at sevens and somewhere else. But the whole next week, I couldn't stand up straight. And my head was bent over and I couldn't move, you know, from being against Frank the whole time. But So that's how it started. And then I just, you know, we had a pretty good team at KU back then. And pretty interesting story. Uh, it, it actually originated years before when... Uh, uh, we were negotiating. Uh, there were several of us that played for Kansas City Rugby Club that wanted to play at the highest level of rugby. We wanted to play the best rugby we could play. And every year the, uh, the biggest match of the year was against the Blues and it was always, you know, the toughest uh, match. Uh, always a lot of blood left on the field. Uh, it, it was brutal. Uh, but those were the funnest matches that we ever played in. Then we came up here, or we came and played with City and Kirk and I, and uh, Hannibal, Steve Hayes, and Gary Shaw, and Chandler, Craig Guthier. I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. I think we all wanted to put the two teams together because, you know, I had seen some really good rugby. I had the opportunity to see a bunch of the good California teams. And I just gone, you know, if we want to be really good and compete, you know, we need to 
do you know we need to play better teams more often we wanted to play at a higher level um, you know the only way we felt that we could do it and, and, and the only way I felt that I could play at a higher level was uh, in rugby uh, was representative ball and to get recognized you got to play at the highest level of the game and uh, we felt with uh, by playing with the Blues uh, that we would be able to play at the highest level of the game, play against of the game, play against uh, higher level teams like the Chicago Lions that have national recognition and get recognized possibly by selectors and ultimately make a territorial side with the goal being to, to play on the national team. And uh, the only way to do that we felt was to, to do it with the Blues. So Tommy Doyle wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And then Kirk and I, and we all just said, well, we're not going to switch till we beat him. We negotiated for several years on how to merge. And uh, uh, we negotiated with Tommy Doyle, who is uh, negotiating with Tommy Doyle is like negotiating a nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, you know, it's a no-win situation. And uh, ultimately, uh, a few of us on the Kansas City Rugby Football Club made a vow that we were going to beat the Blues the weekend coming up, and once we beat them, then we we're going to join them. And so I think we beat them the next time we played them, whether I can't remember if it was a spring or a fall. And uh, we played at Swope Park, we won, and the next day all came over to the Blues. The Blues, without us, had gone up to Chicago, and somebody may have already talked about this, but and played the Lions and not only lost and Wally Morgan and some guys got hurt you know to, from getting kicked in the face and stuff and then they when they went to the bar or whatever they went to you know they just gave them a couple beers and a pizza and they all left and just left them there so it just kind of left a bad taste in everybody's mouth so the next fall I think it was the Lions came down uh, to play the blues and Kirk and I knew a couple of them from playing on the Western and they, they had three Eagles on their team I think and this big prop named Gary Wilson that was an Englishman and this big guy named Nick Snick that just looked like the guy in uh, uh, what's his name Jaws in the James Bond movie and so on the <laughs> opening kickoff of that game I came down I made the tackle and I was on the bottom of the ruck and I could just kind of I was just kind of looking up and I saw Gary Wilson's face and he literally got hit, punched from two different people from two different sides at the same time you know it was like a cartoon and the whole game just you know the referee quit but anyway we ended up beating them bad you know and they were complaining you know they wish they had every right to but you know I mean I was just kind of standing back on some of it and this guy goes what's wrong with you guys but when it was over uh, we really treated them right, you know. We took, you know, we took good care of them, you know. Beat the shit out of them, made them cry. It was the first game they'd won 77 games in a row, and uh, that was the first game they lost. So that was the one of the first couple of games I ever played with the Blues. So still probably one of my big memories. The uh, <clears throat> significant tournament for me was uh, the 1968 Aspen Rubber Fest, which was the very first Aspen Rubber Fest uh, ever uh, played in Aspen, Colorado, and and we were fortunate 
fortunate enough to win the very first tournament. So uh, I was uh, really, you know, that was really a nice uh, thing to be involved in. Yes, there's nothing really special about any of it other than that 73 heart to me as far as the tournament goes. Now we won the heart after that, but that first one that we put so much effort into, it started in 16, the Blues won in 69, and I actually hand carved the little mugs that they all got. I don't, a lot of those guys don't know that. I don't know if those mugs are even still around. And, but that's when it really started to get organized in 69. And then 70 was a pretty good tournament, 71 wasn't a bad tournament, 72, but 73 is when we got the money. And once the money got put in, that tournament flourished. And when we won our first heart, which was in 1973, I ranked it right there with getting out of Vietnam alive. So that's two things that are pretty important to me in my life. I'm probably one of the only blues that has the blues emblem actually tattooed on their body. The other tournament that I remember that was really a prestigious tournament to me was in 1974. The one in uh, St. Louis when it was the uh, Falcons and the Texas A&M and, and Chicago Lions and it was a just four team round robin deal. And you know, in 1974 we uh, were invited to a rugby tournament in St. Louis. It was my first rugby game under the lights. And uh, it was run by the, I think it was called the, the St. Louis Falcons Invitational. When we played, the other teams were Texas A&M, the Chicago Lions, and the St. Louis Falcons, and we were invited because we'd won the Heart of America. And these were supposedly the four best unions in the country, and thus the four best teams in the country. And they invited uh, three other teams that were gonna have a four, four of the best teams in the area meet in St. Louis for a uh, round robin. The St. Louis Falcons uh, played us in the first game in the afternoon on a Saturday. It was a tough weekend. Uh, old Winklebauer, he was, he was a heck of a, a good uh, wing forward, but he ended up having his, broke his ankle. And we were out of substitutes, so uh, Winklebauer's hurt, so can't let him go off the field, you know, so I put him out at wing. Doyle wasn't letting him out. I mean, he wasn't going to leave because there nobody was coming in. So put him, he put him back at fullback, and and they every time they got the ball and, and they got pressure, they'd kick it to him, <laughs> knowing that he was hurt. They figure out that Wankelbauer's hurt. So every time they kick that ball to Wankelbauer, and all you could hear is, oh! He would catch that ball though, and then boom, up, down he'd go. Every time he kicked it, he'd be back there saying, not again. <laughs> anyway. And we'd get over there and ruck over and get the ball and back would go. And this shit, he must have got hit 10, 15 times out there. After the game, they took his wife, was a nurse, took him to the hospital, and he had a broken ankle. Under the lights that night, we played Texas A&M, and we beat them. So Sunday, we had to play the Chicago Lions in the championship game, and we beat Chicago Lions. So I guess you could say it was a tournament of champions, and, and the Blues won it, 1974. And uh, we went in as basically ranked number four, and we beat all of them, all three of them, and it was kind of a mythical na national championship at that time. So in 74, we felt we were the national champions. They're all characters. I mean, that, that was one unique thing about it. I mean, it, you know, it, you had Tommy, and, and, and Tommy, Tommy was a, a fierce competitor, I'll put it that way. Uh, he didn't care for life, limb, or anybody in between him and the ball, and, but that was good, because he led by example. And then you had Frank, and, and then you had Large Larry, better known as Ray Rich at the time. Well, you know, most all the old guys, you know, of course, Frank Maricatani and, and uh, Ray Ritchie and Jim Graybill. And, and it, I think the young guy were Chris Stockard and, and Jim Snayweiss. And, 
and uh, although Jim's probably about my age, but uh, you know a lot of guys like that, and you know they'd come and go, and uh, but uh, they're the pretty hardcore uh, group. You know Frank was obviously there when I started, and and he was uh, just solid as a rock. Neil Tejan, uh, who should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, was as good a prop, as aggressive and a hard hitter. He got thrown out of a game. He, in a final with Aspen uh, at the heart one year, he got thrown off the pitch because he hit too hard. He tackled the guy too hard and they ejected him. He just, he was just straight ahead. I mean, he, and a nice guy, just off the field. He was just a great guy. Winkler, of course, was Winkler. Uh, he, I can remember him, him, I don't know who we were playing, but we moved into a set piece one time, or he moved into a set piece one time, and they locked in, and he threw up all over the, I mean, he, he just as they came in, he threw up, just projectiled all, everybody backed off, and went just wiped his mouth off, and they went back down at it again. We picked up a lot of good backs. Vic Clark, Danny Pluth, uh, then with, like you say, Stockard and Jacoby, they joined us. We had a Wolverine named York. He was about half nuts, but he was a damn good ball player. Uh, a guy came from Boston, uh, old Bill Fox, called him dad. Great big old prop, but a good ball player. Andy Brown, uh, just, and in the very beginning, we had the Freshen Boys. Uh, they were part of that group prior to my coming to the club, but they were part of the club. The Freshens and uh, Danny Denzer. I mean, it's just, just a whole raft of people. Wally, and then old Steve Terrell, better known as Mumbles. Uh, he worked as hard as anybody I know to play the game, and he he put in a lot of sweat equity. Uh, Frank and Neil, Tejan, Jerry Rutherford, Dan Denzer, we had Jake, we had a number of different guys in the second row during the course. Chris Stockard and Jake Jacoby, both the best second rows. I was a number eight, Tommy Doyle was a wing forward. And then Wooby, the scrum half. Uh, he was, he walked to a different beat of the drum, but he was a damn good ball player. A damn good ball player. You know, there were, uh, Jim Graybell was certainly a, a presence when I first started. He and, and Ruben Horse were really sort of trading off at, at uh, scrum half. And uh, Graybell was a character. Uh, all these guys were, and I think that's one of the reasons obviously I fell in love with the sport, were the, the characters. Uh, and the character of those people too, literally. Uh, yeah, Graybell was great. Gabhart, uh, uh, was uh, a second row that was just real sort of stoic and, and uh, uh, a no-nonsense kind of guy. Uh, Billy Houlihan was, a, was just hilarious. He was just hilarious, especially off the pitch. We were out in front of, uh, used to be a bunch of bars, maybe still along Main, 51st and Main, and there was a disco kind of place there once. And he, he literally, one night we came out of there and he tried to tackle a moving vehicle. He literally ran into the street and bounced off a car trying to tackle it. I mean, he's, he was just, you know, those are the kind of people you wanted. <laughs> you wanted a guy that could attack a car. Pat, Pat O'Neill was a, a tall, thin a guy that, that graduated from Shawnee Mission East and was going to the Kansas City Art Institute. And, uh, you know, the thing I remember about him, he, he was always eating. I mean, he always had, always had some sandwich or something he was always eating. But anyway, he was a great friend. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun together. He was, he was a ferocious rugby player. I mean, even at practice, he would hit hard. And uh, he was probably one of the better rugby players that the, you know, we had at that time, for sure. I was in Memphis when I broke my nose the week before, so you had to, I kind of thought that would help, but it just improved my looks was all. So it was uh, about the only thing, because every time you got hit, you know, your head would hurt. So it was, uh, but we got through it, you know. And then there was other Memphis stories that we don't want to get into, so. We, we won the tournament in Memphis, but we got in trouble in Memphis, which we were going to play for the championship, but they kicked us out due to a horrendous fight which the Blues had to go to court over. Didn't do very well in court, but we, uh, it was their fault. It was down in Warrensburg and they were beating us by two points. It was, it was the closest that the Warrensburg team ever came to beating the Blues. 
and uh, we were driving and uh, it was near the end of the game and we had a, a loose ruck about five yards from the try zone. They managed to get the ball and just booted it and uh, so I was fly half so they, and, and the fullback he come up into the line because we thought we might score. So I went streaking back and the ball just kept going, kept going and I circled around it and Doyle was running back with me. He says, Hemer, let's run this way and I just dropped the ball down and he goes, Hemer, you dumb son, what a fucking kick! <laughs> and I was probably 60 yards away. Uh, you know, maybe not 60, you know, it gets a little longer with age, but you know, it was a drop goal, went straight through the uprights, and kicked that, and game was over. When we were playing, how we could get in our car, go to Des Moines, we could go to Oklahoma City, you know, we'd go to Wichita, we'd go up to KU, go to K-State, you know, down to Columbia. You were, you know, a tank of gas. These guys were spending, you know, they were having to get on planes, you know, to travel. And, uh, you know, just uh, not only that, you look at how much money are they having to throw in. And it's a good thing for the insurance every year, you know, because well, we didn't have insurance. A lot of us didn't have insurance, and, but we had a, an insurance agent. So uh, he always, I think the statute of limitations has expired, but uh, hell, he would have everybody <laughs> had the form filled out. And if they got hurt, <laughs> the next day they signed it and put the date in and gave him you know, the deposit and they'd have insurance. You know? <laughs> but it was generally they were signing it on the way to the hospital. So <laughs> and I'll just say his name was Duke and we'll just go from there. <laughs> I remember Wankler, when we played for, I think I was playing for the Blues actually, but I always, everybody had said he was deaf because he hit people so late. You know, and we just all believed it. And then when we played for the Blues, we realized he wasn't deaf at all. He just hit people late, but they'd always tell you that, so. We lost a real close game on a uh, hugely disputed call where I'm still, hours after the game, I'm chasing the referee around Aspen, chewing his ass out. And he said, well, they were, they would have won eventually anyhow. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't need your help, did they, if they were that good? So. I mean, one time uh, we were coming back from, from Wichita and dumb David Sheehan and uh, I think it was Denzer had screwed up in the, uh, screwed up the beef side game. We ended up losing the beef side game and Tommy told him to go in to the liquor store and buy a case of beer and that would be their, their penance. And then he left them there. <laughs> he just drove off and left them. <laughs> No, I'm just proud to have played and proud to still be and uh, proud to see what happens going forward. I think the Blues have come a long way. Hey, I'm, 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 proud, I'm proud as all get out. You know, I've got some long-lasting relationships. You know, the only thing I can say about the Blues today is they are in good hands.